Adam, first off, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, how are you feeling and where are you today? Feeling good, Kurt. Happy to be here. Um, I'm at my home office uh, in Beverly Hills uh, in Los Angeles, uh, California, and uh, starting off the new year uh, real strong. There's a lot going on here. Yeah, great. Um, one, of our one of your advisors, Ilya Posen, introduced us uh, circa 2019 and I'm also friends with Brian Garrett at Crosscut, and I had known that Crosscut had been uh, invested as a limited partner in Strut Capital. So you came onto my radar from two really uh, great guys, um, and you took a meeting with me at your office in Santa Monica and really were generous with your time and attention and uh, really excited about um, our conversation today, Adam. Um, we're going to got a lot of ground to cover from your schooling, your legal background, uh, the incredible business you built with uh, Long Island iced tea brands, and now your work as a very active early stage uh, tech investor. So I'm keen to dig in. And uh, you said you're living your best life in the 90210 now, but I'm so curious to hear your personal story. Like, where'd you grow up and uh, where'd you go to school? Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I'm actually from Johannesburg, South Africa, um, originally. Um, Grew up there and then at the age of seven, um, moved to the United States um, uh, to Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I went to school uh, at Northwestern University uh, in Chicago, uh, did the Kellogg undergraduate certificate program there. I uh, was lucky enough to meet my wife there uh, as well. Um, and then uh, I went to Georgetown Law, um, you know, thought that getting a JD would, uh, you know, make me a, a better businessman and, you uh, I uh, had a great experience there. Um, and then after Georgetown, um, went to uh, Kirkland and Ellis uh, in their New York corporate practice group, uh, doing M&A and, and private equity uh, transactional work. Um, and then I uh, just got the itch, uh, you know, that sort of entrepreneurial itch uh, left. And uh, my brother and I started a company in the CPG space uh, called Long Island Brand Beverages. Um, we bootstrapped that company to 40 million in top line, um, ended up selling it to a middle market private equity fund. Um, called uh, Cullen Investments, and they actually combined the company with a few other assets and took the public on the NASDAQ. So I feel very lucky, uh, you know, to, in a, you know, at a, at a very sort of young age, to get some very robust legal and operational expertise. And, and I take those learnings and try and channel them, um, you know, to helping the founders that we work with to be as successful as they can be uh, when they're trying to get from zero to one. Yeah, I love that. So you're uh, kind of tacking on the Elon Musk uh, path from the South African to uh, American success story. Doing, doing my best. One, one day at a time. <laughs> have you ever met Elon? Uh, I've not. I um, have quite a few people uh, in, in the network uh, that know him, but I haven't had the privilege yet. Um, South Africa is a really fascinating place. Um, it's actually one of my favorite accents. Yeah, I can do my South accent. African accent very easily. I can just turn it on and it comes out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. My brother and sister are twins. They're seven years older than me. Um, so when they uh, when they moved to the States, they kind of retained a lot of the accent. Uh, whereas for me, because I was so young, um, it's very much an American accent. But when I'm around my parents and my family, uh, it comes out. And uh, my wife is not upset uh, when, I, uh, when I bust out the accent. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I dated a South African girl probably 10, 15 years ago, and uh, she called herself a Safa. <laughs> Got yeah. it. Yep. And yep. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember what that was, but she turned me on to this place in LA, which is a South African bar called the Springbok. Oh, yeah. The yeah. Well, that's, that's the, the national animal of the rugby team, and uh, the Springboks are, are legends. The Springboks versus the New Zealand All Blacks. That's the probably the best rugby match you can possibly yeah. find. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's so cool. I didn't know that about you. Um, do you get back there ever? Unfortunately with COVID, it's obviously really tough, especially with South Africa being like, you know, ground zero for Omicron yeah. or close to ground zero. Yeah. Um, but I was back there, uh, I think it was in 2019 and, uh, you know, South Africa is a big part of, of, you know, who I am. Um, you know, my family, um, you know, escaped the Holocaust, um, you know, parts of my family escaped the Holocaust and, and came to South Africa with nothing, um, and ended up, you know, you know, creating strong sort of entrepreneurial paths for themselves. So, um, you know, South Africa is a, a big part of, of who I am and, and my fiber. And uh, we still have a lot of friends there that, you know, it's not the safest place to be, but there's just a lot of pride and, and, and they love being there. Yeah, I'm a big surfer. Um, would love to go surf Jeffrey's Bay. And I just hear that um, Durban 
I went to UC Santa Barbara too, and I heard Durbin's a lot like a, kind of a Santa Barbara vibe. Yeah, you're you're 100 right. Um, I always tell people the way to do it is fly into Johannesburg because that's basically what you have to do. Stay there only a day or two, um, but but as fast as you can, get to a safari, uh, get to the wine farms in Stellenbosch and Franschhoek, um, and then get to Cape Town. Uh, I tell people that Cape Town is kind of like Napa oh. Valley meets South Beach. Uh, it's just this incredible situation and the topography with Table Mountain in the background is just a whole other level. Yeah, I think I had my wires crossed. Uh, yeah, replace uh, Cape Town with Durban. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So what what was it about... Um, I'm, I'm curious about the the your law background. Um, what? How, how has that helped you? I mean, I think it's some pretty, pretty obvious, uh, you know, the mechanics of law, but yeah. how, how, how useful has it yeah, been? It's interesting. You know, there's, there's been some VCs that started out, um, you know, as attorneys got their JDs and, and they've done really well. You know, the North star for me is, is Chris Saka. You know, he went to Georgetown law. Um, he was in big law for a little bit and then uh, I believe went to Google and then obviously created a, an incredible career for himself. Um, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to venture capital, from a legal, you know, from a technical perspective, in terms of the legal nuances, we all follow National Venture Capital Association boilerplate um, precedent. So it's not like um, the legal minutia is highly complex. Um, but I still feel like <clears throat> if you have a JD and you know how to think like an attorney, um, it can it can just sort of add to that sort of um, status as a trusted advisor for your founders. Um, you know, and I think for us, given that we are you know, we are leading seed rounds out of Struck Capital Fund 2, which is our, our $75 million fund. Um, you know, we, we want to not only be that first investor and that first board member, but really that first mentor, that first coach. Um, and I find that founders knowing that, you know, you know that, that I have a legal background and it can be a little dangerous there if necessary, um, they like it. They like having me sort of on their team and by their side. So, um, I definitely think it, it adds, uh, I wouldn't say it's a condition precedent to being a good VC. There's been many VCs that don't have legal backgrounds, but I think it's a nice positive and uh, I don't regret it. I, I definitely think during the time when I was slaving away at 1L and I had other friends that were entrepreneurs or, or making lots of money at hedge funds and private equity, I, you know, I remember looking at myself and saying, is this the right decision? Um, but when I look back in hindsight, I think it's a great differentiator and I'm, uh, I'm really proud of, of uh you know, of going through that process, going to Georgetown Law, getting into a firm like Kirkland and and then and then, you know, being able to channel my entrepreneurial spirit and leaving. You know, there's a lot of lawyers, unfortunately, that have golden handcuffs. They they would have loved to to leave and do something and they haven't. Um, I feel like I got enough of it and then uh, and then got out. Yeah, for sure. What so you did some M and A work there, right? Yeah. Um, were any deals uh, worth highlighting that you yeah the biggest kind of proud of or that work? would be like a household name deal would be the three G capital um, and Berkshire uh, Berkshire Hathaway acquisition um, of Heinz um, that was uh, was pr a pretty massive deal and just something really cool to work on um, I was also involved uh, in the uh, Skinny Girl um, um, transaction uh, with Jim Beam and that um, was sort of what gave my brother and I the spark to want to start Long Island brand beverages. We thought that, you know, nobody sort of was owning anything in the ready to drink Long Island iced tea category in the same way that uh, Bethany Frankel had with, um, you know, with Skinny Girl, um, you know, sort of skinny margarita. Um, so that, that, that was, uh, was interesting too, because I was able to sort of uh, take that experience and then use that to sort of spark entrepreneurial aspirations. Um, but as things typically work, we then had to pivot um, and we actually ended up finding a ton of traction um, just being a, a, a non-alcoholic um, iced tea product, but really benefiting um, from sort of the grassroots inertia associated with, you know, launching an, an iced tea product in Long Island and, and really getting a ton of traction along the Eastern Corridor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, you sort of read my mind. I was going to ask sort of what was the insight on identifying the niche. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, that must have taken a, a lot of guts at that time, because that was what, 2011, 2012? Yeah, it, it definitely took a lot of guts. Uh, my mother was crying uh, when I told her that I was leaving Kirkland and Ellis <laughs> <laughs> to go and join my brother and start a CBG company. But um, I think at the end of the day, you know, adversity 
um, is a healthy situation. You know, I always love the quote, adversity is the stone upon which I sharpen my sword. Um, I think you have to be able to bet on yourself. And, uh, you know, now as a, as a husband and a father with a second child on the way, um, life's a lot more complicated than it was back then. Uh, so my advice to anybody listening is if you're going to bet on yourself, do it when you're young. Um, cause you're, you're in a situation where you can, you can, uh, you can fail, you can take a few falls and you can get back up. Yeah, that's fair. So what, what, what was the sort of leverage that you guys were able to find to be able to make sort of a risky career move at that point? You know, we were just coming out of great financial crisis. Um, you know, what, what, what gave you the, the, um, the leverage and the guts to, to, to press? Yeah. Go? I mean, I think, I think definitely, you know, just when I look at, um, you know, my, my grandfather on my father's side and my grandfather on my mother's side, um, you know, my grandfather on my father's side had like 12 brothers and sisters. He was the only one that got out. They were all murdered, you know, essentially like right before the Holocaust and, um, you know, similar situation for my, my, uh, my mother's father. Um, to see them arrive in these foreign lands and, and create incredible businesses. Um, I think it showed me that I had that sort of entrepreneurial DNA and it drove me to want to bet on myself. Um, I think generally though, when it, as it related to Long Island brand beverages, we just thought there was a big gap in the market as well. Uh, the number one I see on the market was Arizona iced tea, which is like 60 grams of high fructose corn syrup. Um, and we thought that if we could come out there with a healthier RTD product that, you know, used reverse osmosis filtration to preserve the integrity of the tea leaf, cane sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup, um, and then paired that with, with rock solid execution that we could really do something. And, um, you know, we got into over 10,000 mom and pops, Costco shopper at 7-Eleven. Um, we even petitioned the USPTO for the trademark to Long Island Ice Tea in the RTD category, and we're able to get that. Um, so all in all, uh, I think we saw a gap in the market, we saw an opportunity, and then I think we had, um, you know, inspirational figures, um, you know, in, in our uh, in our family that that I think, uh, you know, put, you know, really served as a uh, it's nice inertia for us to get into it. You know, unfortunately, I never had um, the privilege of meeting my mother's father. Uh, he died of a heart attack shortly after um, my mother's wedding. My mother got married, and uh, my my grandfather um, he uh, you know he died um, when I was very young. So you know, I, I'd always heard of these these incredible figures that I never had the chance to meet, but I felt like they're a part of me and a part of the entrepreneurial spirit that I think is in my DNA. So I think it was important for both myself and my brother um, to channel that spirit. And, uh, you know, after, after we sold, uh, you know, Long Island brand beverages, um, you know, my brother then went and co-founded a company called Hungry Root, um, which is backed by Lightspeed and Al Catterton and recently raised at a $750 million valuation. Um, he has another company called Noops, uh, which is redefining uh, pudding. Um, and he just closed a seed round from Lehrer Hippo Ventures. Um, so he's really doing his thing on that side. And um, I, I sort of took that entrepreneurial spirit and, and decided, you know, how could I take my learnings and my success um, and really share that with as many individuals as possible? And I thought venture capital and backing young founders um, is an amazing way to do that. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think we've both done a good job taking the essence of entrepreneurship that we think, that we think is in our DNA, um, taking a calculated risk, um, and then pushing, pushing hard. Yeah. I love that. I got sort of the chills when you were, you know, talking about, um, your grandparents that you hadn't met and, and kind of channeling that, that sort of DNA that that's awesome. What's your brother's uh, name? Gregory, Greg struck. Sweet. You guys struck there gold. I think that's what we'll have to call the episode. <laughs> Dad, my, uh, my wife's uh, last name is uh, G-O-U-L-D, Gould, but a lot of people pronounce it gold. Um, so I believe our wedding hashtag was struck gold or something. something I love that. Oh, it's so, so apropos. Uh, um, well, so that's a great segue. So what, what brought you out to LA and, you know, what um, it sounds like, you know, you mean you kind of gave a little foreshadow of kind of what was next after um, Long Island iced tea brands. Did you, did you take some time to figure out what was next or did you immediately kind of just get, get, get the, the firm yeah, started? Yeah. So I, I started doing, once I knew that sort of the acquisition was on the horizon, um, I'd started, you know, just sort of I had people in my network that were, you know, raising SPVs and, and doing things in venture. And I had buddies that were at major firms. And I just thought that that would be a really nice sort of next path uh, for me. 
Um, I think one of the things that attracted me to law as well, even though I was on the transactional side and not the, you know, not the litigation side was again, just being like that trusted advisor. So um, I thought that venture capital um, would, would just be a great a sort of natural sort of next step. So started, you know, doing a few SPVs, et cetera, but then really got into it um, after the exit. And, uh, you know, I actually did SPVs um, from 2013 until 2017, which is when I raised Track Capital Fund One. So it wasn't like I went from selling a company right into, you know, an institutionally backed venture fund. Um, you know, it took me some time. And I think, uh, you know, that when I look at sort of my narrative and, and my path, um, it's not been a sort of linear trajectory. Um, you know, I'm an immigrant from South Africa. Um, I was trained as an attorney. Um, I then sold a company, which is amazing, but it's not a tech company. Um, so I really had to, again, push through adversity um, and show everybody that, that I'm, I'm meant to be here. Um, but it took some time. So, um, you know, that that's kind of uh, kind of how I got into venture, but I think in terms of moving to LA, um, you know, between Chicago, DC and New York, um, there were just a lot of freezing winters there. <laughs> and uh, my, uh, my <laughs> wife went to uh, study theater at Northwestern. She obviously wanted to come to LA as well. And uh, we had some family here um, and we, we literally just decided uh, to get an Airbnb here. And uh, we never looked back. I think I saw this ecosystem as, um, uh, as just sort of a, a real green field um, of opportunity. And, uh, you know, looking back, I think it was 100% the right decision. What year did you sell um, Long so Island? That was in uh, 2013. Okay. So that was a pretty quick ramp. It was really quick. Yeah, it was really, really quick. Flawless execution. We were doing, you know, I was 100% full time on it um, after I left Kirkland and Ellis. And I only stayed at Kirkland and Ellis for a year. Um, which was also, mm -hmm. also took a lot of guts. Um, the concept of putting in a full year, working 3000 hours, getting great partner reviews, and then telling them that you're leaving, that's not something that they see every day. Um, yeah, you know, my, my sure. brother had done a lot of, of testing and, and provided, um, some inertia to the business while I was essentially part-time on it. Um, and he had probably been doing that for about a year. And then I came in, you know, and then we really executed, uh, but all in all, in all, um, it was very quick, um, flawless execution. I think there, there's always that uh, mindset of did we sell at the right time? Could we have stayed longer? But I think given what we've both accomplished uh, since then, uh, we think it was it was a perfect sort of launch pad for us, um, and it, it resulted yeah. in, uh, in in great success. Yeah. Well, I want to double click into Struck Capital because that's sort of the now. But I do want to in the spirit of learning out loud with with the core theme of the show what was the unlock um for the long island iced tea brands like how do you go from zero to one in two years to having you know some of the biggest retailers and in, in ten thousand um outlets like what was the distribution yeah so there? it's it's very difficult to do because typically what happens especially if you're trying to bootstrap a beverage company typically what happens is the slotting fees can just kind of destroy um your margins before you start and that's why a lot um of cbg companies need to raise capital and yet um, when you look at sort of the acquiring landscape you know typically these unless you're you're few and far between, but typically these companies are being sold to the likes of like a Campbell Seafresh for $200 million, right? So it's, it's a very difficult situation where you need capital um, to get through that initial J curve where your margins are being destroyed by slotting fees. Um, and, and, you, and most importantly, you need capital to hit scale um, so that, you know, your margins can get a little bit better, even though compared to software, it's still a very low margin business. Um, we were in a really good uh, situation because we had an individual in our network that had vending machines all along the Eastern Corridor. So we were able to look a lot larger than we were um, from the get-go um, by essentially saturating you know, his footprint along the totality of the Eastern Corridor. So that meant that we could come in on day one and place really large orders, which typically um, a company that's mm -hmm. starting is not, is not able to do. Um, I think also having a mindset of being, um, you know, sort of health first, um, you know, being um, non-GMO, being, uh, you know, cane sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup, 
you know, going through um, a, a uh, you know, ver reverse osmosis filtration to preserve those nutrients. Um, that was also something that we noticed the big box retails were actually into. I think uh, they were seeing that there was a sort of health movement that was coming. Um, and I think positioning us in that mm -hmm. sense made us look more innovative um, compared to, uh, you know, other competitors. So I really think it was a, a confluence of, of a plethora of, of events. But I think at the end of the day, um, what it really comes down to is execution. Um, when you're sort of taking a team and they are, it's a team of, of distributors and you have to start small, um, you know, and you're going from bodega to bodega, mom and pop to mom and pop, you know, and then you're, you're sort of auditing um, your distribution channels and making sure that your end caps are where they're supposed to be. Um, that if you did pay slotting fees, that your bottles are where they're supposed to be. The whole method of productizing that motion um, is very, very difficult. Um, but we did a really good job. Uh, like a really good job. So, um, mm. you know, I, I think we just almost almost ran it like a military uh, operation with, with flawless execution. But I also think it took a bit of luck um, and a lot of perseverance. Yeah, yeah. That all sounds like uh, how it often is. You, you know, you have to, um, you know, be at the right place at the right time with the right attitude. And, and you guys seem to, you know, kind of, use a metaphor mapped a really great recipe to the appetite of the market. So, um, awesome. So let's fast forward to now. So struck capital, um, what, um, what's the thesis? What, what are the, I know you guys are sort of have a really big growth thrust and, and the business is kind of transforming, but catch, catch us up on, on, uh, on struck capital and we'll, we'll dig into yeah, the so, details. You know, for us, it's really just about backing incredible founders that have unique information asymmetries and really being there for them at their earliest of phases. You know, we, 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 you know, we don't, we don't try and talk negatively about, you know, other colleagues in the venture ecosystem, but we have found, especially at the seed stage, um, that a lot of GPs talk about value add, they talk about platform, um, they make a lot of promises and then they underwrite deals and they kind of disappear. Um, for us, we want founders to understand that every single check that we write, um, it's truly a high conviction uh, situation where we live and die by that check. Um, we treat each investment like a marriage. Um, for me, as a 34-year-old GP, I'm highly energetic and highly motivated uh, to make sure that the firm that bears my last name you know, is world-class and successful, um, and I lead with sweat equity. Um, and I think that then trickles down throughout the totality of the firm. I think our founders really feel that support. So, you know, at the end of the day for us, we've done things like, you know, infusing core technology innovation into our platform to help our companies in automated and scalable ways. But what it really comes down to, especially when companies are at their infancy stages, um, is does the GP, does the partner that's sponsoring the deal um, really care about this? And do they feel like their life is on the line in the same way that the founder feels? Um, and that that's a very special, um, you know, situation uh, that that you really have to create from day one, um, and that really is our culture. So I think that we've been able to seal a lot of market share in Los Angeles in a short period of time because when founders reference check us, um, you know, they 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 understand that invest having struck you know lead your your seed round. It's not just getting capital. Um, it's not just you know getting a name. It's not just getting introductions to downstream investors. Um, it's really getting a full platform and operating team that wants to battle with you in the trenches and takes your problems as if they are their own um, and will do everything necessary to make sure you succeed. Um, so that, that's our core product and everything that we do um, starts from that ethos. You know, when I would meet before I had my fund and I would meet founders and put up SPVs and try to get allocations into their deals, I'd say, I'm going to put up more sweat equity per dollar invested than anyone on your cap table. Um, and we channel that ethos with us today. Um, and it's the exact same, um, you know, situation. Yeah. Well, you've gotten yourself into some great deals and, uh, the, the, there is definitely a halo on the brand for sure. What what are the uh, check sizes? I know you guys are writing typically bigger check sizes. Yeah, at the you know, seed the, everything's stage gone crazy because it's a very frothy market right now. But our typical situation would be, you know, $3 million round, $1.5 million check. And we want to capture at least 10 to 15% ownership on a fully diluted post-money valuation basis. 
And um, what are some of the highlights in the portfolio so far? So, for example, Hunt Club, we're a, a Sendoso client. We just deployed yeah. it. I know that's one yeah, of your Yeah, Sendoso's been a great one for us. Um, you know, big kudos to the team over there. They just closed a $100 million round by SoftBank at a 650 post. Um, they've not only established themselves as a, a category leader, but they're essentially a category, Gartner recognized category creator. So it's been incredible for us. Uh, you know, we think that their business model works really well um, internationally. They just opened up a large office in Ireland, um, and I know they're trying to really expand through, throughout Europe. So uh, very excited about them. Um, another real high flyer for us has been Mythical Games, um, which is in L.A., um, we were the first ever investor in Mythical Games. I was the first ever board member. We put a million dollars into their seed round, which for us at the time was a large check. Um, and they just recently closed a $150 million round led by Andreessen Horowitz at a $1.25 billion valuation. So to just see them, you know, you talk about what, what we did with Long Island brand beverages in two years. They've only been doing this for three years. So it's been pretty insane um, to see them sort of really hit escape velocity and, uh, you know, I believe that they could could sort of be, uh, you know, sort of the economic backbone for the metaverse uh, long term. And uh, it's it's just incredible seeing what they're doing. Um, they're in the right place at the right time with flawless execution. Um, so for, for me to be the first ever investor in that um, and for it to be an L.A. deal, um, I think it says a lot about sort of our next gen mindset um, and our ability to spot massive companies way before they become in vogue. Yeah. Uh, another deal you guys did that I'm a big fan of is yeah. Brainbase. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big fan of Nate, um, big fan cool of Nate, business. you know, young founder, um, you know, really trying to help, um, you know, brands with very robust um, intellectual property portfolios manage and monetize the totality of their IP. Um, you know, again, when you talk about pattern recognition, you know, Brainbase Assist is essentially a system of record platform um, that once you get in there, we're just finding that, you know, licensors and now even in the future licensees are just managing the totality of their business, um, you know, even post, um, you know, execution of, of contracts, they're, they're literally managing the design, everything that has to do with their IP portfolio, royalties, payments, all of it, and it's through their platform. So um, Brandbase is a really great example of a sort of system of record platform um, that can then be a Trojan horse to a plethora of ancillary revenue streams. And uh, yeah, you know, we were excited to lead that. I uh, had Bessemer Venture Partners lead the Series A. And uh, I know Nate is working tirelessly uh, to make sure that they flawlessly execute. How many deals have you guys done? And what does the distribution look like as far as like category? Like you guys seem to be pretty focused on like more enterprise for the m most yeah. part, but I think. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. we've done 10 deals from fund two. Um, it's probably going to end up being around 20 to 22 deals. Cause again, we just practice a more concentrated version of, of venture capital because uh, we're operating side yep. by side with our founders. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think we are definitely, we're technically a generous fund, but there's no question about it. We have a B2B motion. We've had a lot of success uh, in horizontal vertical SaaS, FinTech, uh, marketplaces, uh, MarTech. Um, we love sort of like soft infrastructure, API plumbing plays. We've been doing a little bit more in healthcare, but again, even the things we're doing in healthcare, these are paradigms that we've seen in other verticals that will work really nicely in the healthcare vertical. A good example of that is, is Verifiable, um, which is the equivalent of Checker, um, you know, which is, I think they're, they've hit $4 billion in enterprise value, automating background checks. You know, uh, Verifiable is doing the same thing as it relates to um, you know, provider credentialing um, in the healthcare space. So that's that's a great example of a of a of a, a pattern and a paradigm that we've already seen play out in a non healthcare space um, that we think would work perfectly. In fact, even better for the healthcare space. Um, and we uh, we essentially led the pre seed round of Verifiable, um, and they've now been able to get the equivalent, you know, the likes of Tiger Global and Apollo Projects um, onto their cap table. So um, so yeah, we're definitely a generous fund, but we we love uh, a B two B motion. Um, before we press play on the, on the show today, you were giving me some context about, you know, kind of the thrust for 2022, um, talk, talk to us about that and you're kind of re repositioning yeah, yeah. So, the, the, you know, the way that we're thinking of it is, you know, the, the firm is struck, um, but there's really three different entities underneath that. So our core product, um, is struck capital. Um, you know, that is right now strike capital fund two, which is our $75 million seed fund. Um, you know, at some point over the next six months, we'll be going out for fund three, 
We could also do an opportunity fund for fund one because we have around six or seven companies that we think can or will hit, you know, uh, unicorn status. So that's sort of the core product. Um, that's the uh, that's like that's the heart um, of the firm. Um, in 2017, um, we sold a portfolio company to Bittrex, um, which was one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges at the time. And we were approached by a bunch of GPs in LA to then give you know help them get exposure to the space. Um, and we launched a um, an evergreen fund, um, which we now call Struck Crypto. Um, it was very small; only ten million dollars was raised. Uh, but the fund now has over a hundred million dollars in AUM. So, um, you know, we have a full investment team and platform team um, on the crypto side. Um, and I think, as everybody knows, you know, Web three distributed ledger technology um, is here to stay from our perspective. And I think the nice thing is. We're not one of those funds that all of a sudden now, because it's hot, are telling everybody that we're experts. We've actually been here since 2017. Um, we have we have outperformed Bitcoin. We have outperformed the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, um, and we believe that we can take the business building fundamentals that we have um, on the capital side um, and bring them to distributed autonomous organizations who operate in Web three. Because again, the pattern recognition and you know we believe that there are fundamental patterns. If you're getting a company from zero to one, it doesn't matter if it's a DAO, it doesn't matter if it's in healthcare, it doesn't matter if it's in you know horizontal SaaS. We believe those building blocks are the same, so we feel really excited to continue building out um, that side of the firm. And, and it's an evergreen fund, so we literally take on new investors every month. Um, and then the third thing that we're doing, which I'm really excited about, um, is we're launching a studio. Um, and the reason we're doing that is, again, you know, we practice such an operationally focused form of venture capital. We really are operating side by side with our founders. A lot of the times at the seed stage, even we're investing in companies pre-product. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, we sort of take a top down thesis where we can identify gaps in the market. Um, and then we kind of spot a few different companies in the area and then we pick one and we lead the seed round. I believe there's an opportunity for us to take the ideation and validation processes in-house and instead of owning 10% of the company or 15% of the company, own 50% of the company and then go to incredible founders with unique information, incredible would-be founders with unique information asymmetries and make a time to value argument to them and say, listen, leave your comfortable job at Google or Amazon um, and come and join us. And in two months, we're going to spin you out. You're going to have you know, a tier one seed fund lead, you know, a three or $4 million round and, and you'll, you'll be off to the races. So I'm um, really excited about that. Um, I've got a world-class uh, founder that is joining me. Um, I'm not going to announce that yet, um, but we will, we will certainly let everybody know uh, when we launch it. And, um, you know, we, we just think there's a huge opportunity to also add another studio to the LA ecosystem. Yeah. I love that. Um, how many deals do you think you'll, target for the next year yeah, or two so the for way that, the studio. What we are promising investors for the studio is 10 spin outs. Um, so the way I would say that LP is, is, you know, listen, a conventional seed fund, you know, is going to be 20 to 25 companies for ease of math, call it 20 companies owning 10 to 15%. So this is going to be half the number of companies, you know, only 10, but we're going to own 50%. So five X the ownership. So the risk reward profile is really interesting. And, uh, you know, we think we can spin out 10 companies essentially over three years. So you're talking about three to four spin outs a year. Yeah. And then on the crypto fund, is that an actively managed fund that you guys are actively, you know, it's, it's liquid, um, similar to like what, I guess you mentioned Galaxy. So it, it's an Arca evergreen and these other structure, ones. but it's, you, know, you would think of it as a venture fund. So because we're holding tokens, there's obviously opportunities after a, a, an investment that we've made has a token generation event. Um, if we believe that the company has really hit escape velocity and there's a lot of opportunity for upside, um, we can continue holding the token. So that's why we think an evergreen structure for crypto makes a ton of sense. Um, but at the end of the day, the way we're quote unquote generating alpha, it's what we do on the capital side. It's venture, right? It's finding really incredible founders that are crypto native that we think are moving the ball forward, um, you know, deploying our platform, helping mm -hmm. them execute. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously helping them get liquidity, um, you know, a post token generation of that. So, um, it's still a venture like mindset. It's just very focused on crypto. And that's why we have a whole separate investment team for it, because honestly the pace and velocity of innovation in crypto, um, it's just a whole other level. And, and it's gotten to a point where there's a whole jargon, there's a whole lexicon of, 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 uh, of sort of uh, unique jargon. Um, so I, I just find that it helps a lot. Um, if we separate, uh, the investment teams, um, so that, that's, that's what we have going over there. 
Yeah. Are you, um, what's the minimum uh, allocation to participate? Um, so we, uh, you know, we have, we have flexibility. Um, the technical minimum is a million dollars, um, but it can be waived um, by the GP, especially if we think someone is strategic. Um, and especially if, uh, you know, if, if we think they would, they would add to, uh, to the Strat Capital family. Yeah. Great. And then the DAOs are interesting. I mean, that, that seems to be a, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, <laughs> we could, we could yeah, spend you know, hours think, and hours think, about that. I think when but, you think about the concept um, of microtransactions, um, you know, being used to incentivize various forms of behavior, um, and the ability to, um, essentially find ways to incentivize a highly distributed workforce to move the ball forward, you know, on, on a, on a project or something that you're, you're passionate about, you know, where you could essentially put up bounties um, and in an automated way, have smart contracts, pay out rewards for people that do what you're asking them to do. Um, it's a very sort of um, incredible way to think about, um, you know, if I'm a company or if I'm a DAO and I'm trying to move the ball forward, you know, why don't I access all the talent that's available to me, which, which is essentially the entire world. Um, so, so in that sense, um, you know, we still think there's a lot of work that needs to go into sort of um, tooling and, and, and just different ways to ensure that with the sort of decentralized workforce, things can be efficient and, and things can progress. Um, but the, the concept on its face where you can use microtransactions and, and various forms, various incentive mechanisms um, to get people that you don't even know um, to move your project forward, um, that's a, a pretty incredible situation. Yeah. Good friend of mine who was at our wedding, Robert Leshner, yep. co-founded Compound. And it's been really wild just to see how, you know, large that project has gotten. They've, they've oh, yeah. done a pretty good job executing on the DeFi space. It feels like, it feels like 2020 was like the year of DeFi. 2021 was a year of NFTs and it feels like 2022. Yeah. Really I think, uh, I think what's going to happen a lot this year um, is you're going to see a lot of focus on layer two scaling solutions, um, sharding, side chains, um, state channels. Um, I also think uh, what's going to start happening is um, you're going to have just a lot of interoperability amongst um, various base layer protocols. So a lot of the leading protocols now are, are what you would call EVM compatible. So they can play very nicely with Ethereum, but um, they can do it in a way where you're not dealing with a, a lot of the the uh, the scalability issues with Ethereum. So I, I see this sort of as the year of uh, of layer two scaling solutions and just true interoperability amongst um, uh, base layer protocols. I think when we when we first started, it was you know you know sort of one protocol to rule them all, uh, so to speak. And I think what you're going to find is there's going to be um, a lot of sort of use case specific protocols um, that can all interact together and, and be interoperable. So uh, I'm excited for the future. I think I think there's uh, there's still a long long way to go. Yeah, love that. Um, super wonky, uh, you know, conversation about this. It's it's super fun. Um, so thank you for for that. And uh, yeah, I think let's do this. Just kind of keep an eye on time and turn the page. Um, one of the core themes on the show is humanizing humanizing success. And um, I've shared with you, Adam, some of the challenges I've overcome and. Um, I was curious, like, what are you, you've talked about some of your challenges, or, um, you know, with, with your family and whatnot, but is there anything else personally or professionally that you've had to face or overcome that you're comfortable sharing and how did you get over the hurdle and, and what gift did that? Yeah. Kind of challenge yeah. I mean, you? I think, um, you know, I think for me being an immigrant, um, and, and, and coming to America, you know, where in, in a, in a, in a unique way, um, you know, my, my family was lucky to be able to come out of South Africa and come to the States. But when you're dealing then with like hyperinflation in South Africa, a lot of the wealth that uh, we thought we had, we didn't have. Um, and then I kind of at a young age realized that if I wanted to give my children what my father had, you know, from his father, um, I really would have to do a lot of it on my own. Um, and I think just understanding that you can have um, a narrative and a background and a history um, but that really doesn't mean anything <laughs> unless you're, you're ready, willing, and able um, to do the work necessary um, to succeed. I think the fact that I realized that at, at a young age um, helped me a lot. So I think just generally, um, you know, I, I have, you know, friends of mine that, that, 
you know, went to Northwestern with me and went to Georgetown Law and they, and they come from, you know, you know, they, they have individuals and their families that have moved mountains in America. Um, and for me, I didn't have any of that. So to come in and try and be, be an entrepreneur and be a venture capitalist, um, it's really not an easy situation. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what I was able to do again, right, was sort of have a realistic assessment of sort of where I am, um, you know, as, as, a, as an immigrant in America, and then also have a realistic assessment of where I come from and, and sort of where that, that and, and knowing that that entrepreneurial spirit is in me. Um, and then sort of just pushing through adversity and, uh, and making things happen. You know, I think what I mentioned sort of earlier on, on, the, on the podcast is uh, really did not have a linear, um, situ- you know, it, it wasn't this, this clear linear path to, to, you know, becoming a venture capitalist. You know, you, you, you talk about people that, you know, went to Stanford, was an early employee at Facebook, um, you know, sold out and then, you know, maybe started a business and became a venture capitalist. Mine was totally yep. different. I always felt like I had to work harder than anybody else because I had to prove to them that I'm supposed to be here. Um, and I think that that chip on my shoulder um, and that adversity that, I, that I've gone through, um, you know, has really given me an edge, actually, especially when it's seed stage investing. And it really is about sweat equity um, at the end of the day. Who's, who is willing to show up first um, and leave last. And, and that's, that's my mindset. Um, so, you know, yeah. hopefully, uh, hopefully that, uh, that can just, just show all the listeners, you know, that life is tough, things are hard. Um, just continue to persevere, bet on yourself um, and, and you'll hopefully, you know, find what you're looking for. Yeah, uh, that's a reoccurring theme that it's it's it is hard. It's all hard. It's hard to be. It's hard to get wealthy. It's hard to be poor. It's hard to stay healthy. It's hard to be sick. Like you just got to choose wisely. You know, I think when I was younger, I I thought if yeah. I get good grades and I you know everything's just going to work out, and it's like that's not how life works. Like you have no idea what tomorrow holds. I think the pandemic has shown all of us that. So it really is just about you know doing your best each day. And making sure that you can optimize and be the best version of yourself. Um, and I think a lot of people, if they would just put blinders on and focus on being the best version of themselves, um, they would actually accomplish a lot. Yeah, well said. Um, wanted to kind of round round third base here with rapid fire questions, but looking at the clock, um, how are you uh, on yeah, time? Yeah, Do you have, have, a, have a few more minutes or I you got a hard stop? Make sure. Yeah, I have a few more minutes. All right, cool. So, um, our editor is Levi. We'll want to edit that out. Um, all right. So rounding third base, Adam, uh, I love, love the, uh, immigrant story. That's amazing. It really reminds me of, um, some of what, uh, Ilya Posen kind of you know, his story is who, how we met and he came, came uh, from Russia at an early age and, um, pretty awesome he was able to buy his dad uh an aston martin his dad's a big car guy and uh you know pretty epic right so um awesome how how, um how does it you you had mentioned that your mom cried when you uh quit law school how does she feel now Um, i i think that she would love to take more time with me to really figure out you know what i do because i think uh the concept of working with young founders and helping companies go from zero to one that she understands when I start talking about crypto and then it's just way over her head. Um, but, but all in all, no, I think she's extremely proud. And, and I think what's, what's really special for both my parents is, you know, the firm bears, you know, our, our last name. So it's, it's a nice legacy and uh, we just want to keep yeah. doing it the right way. That's the key is just keep your head down and do it the right way. Love that. Well, rounding third base, a couple of rapid fire kind of general uh, interest questions to inter- end the interview. Um, best boss or partner you ever had could be an LP at Struck Capital. Sounds like it might be your brother, Greg. Yeah, yeah. My brother but, uh, is definitely curious. up there, um, but maybe it's a situation where I just know too much. Uh, I think uh, I think someone that I, I really enjoyed uh, working with, um, his name is Michael Sachs. Um, I was on the board with him of a company called Pay Forward. Uh, which is one of my my first uh, investments in the healthcare space, and um, Michael unfortunately passed away um, recently uh, from a sudden heart attack. Um, but he was an extremely um, incredible individual and very accomplished um, healthcare operator and investor. Um, and I I really just loved sort of 
he also went to Northwestern too. He, he, he was a, he was a Northwestern guy and I just felt that he lived life the right way. Um, and I just saw the level of care that he gave to the founders and just how wise he was. And it really showed me, um, you know, sort of my North Star KPI in terms of being a board member, um, you know, what, what that really means and what you want your relationship to be with, with the founding team and management. So, uh, um, you know, my, Michael Sachs is definitely uh, someone that has sort of imprinted on me. And, uh, you know, the short time that I that I had with him was was very special. Yeah, I love that. Good segue into the next question. What What's a culture that you really admire? It could be one of your portfolio companies, um, company just in the general market. Um, and, and, and what, what, a, what yeah, about that do you admire games, and, and want to emulate? I think it's the coolest culture there is. Uh, you know, one of the co-founders, Jamie, who's their chief creative officer, is just such an incredible person, supremely talented. Um, and what I think John and Jamie both bring to the table, given they were both Activision studio heads, um, is they have that chip on their shoulder where they like don't want to work for the man. Um, and I and it, it really just sort of embodies uh, itself in, in an appropriate manner um, in all different aspects of the business. So, you know, at their office in Seattle, um, they, they, they go and they take the board meetings from like what they call the smoking room. And like, it's just this like crazy artsy, like what you would expect from people that designed, you know, DJ Hero, Guitar Hero and Call of Duty. And um, I just think from mm -hmm. a culture perspective, they know how to execute. They know how to lead. They know how to work their their tails off, but they also know how to have fun. Um, and they also have um, a, a sort of uniqueness about them uh, that I appreciate. Yeah, I'd love that. Well, I'm excited to dig in. I, I, I maybe one day, is, if uh, I'm lucky, I can go have a meeting happen. in the smoking room. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's one thing the world does not know about Adam Struck that we wouldn't know if I wasn't too curious to ask? It could just be a fun fact. Yeah, maybe yeah. You're the I Northwestern think, uh, mascot. I think Who for knows? me, people see me in business as like someone that is very strong, and you know, I'm a leader. Um, but in, in my household, especially with my kids, uh, my wife is the leader and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a girl dad. I've got one girl, uh, one daughter, and I've got another uh, daughter on the way. And uh, it, it's very special for me just to see, um, you know, just sort of how my wife naturally, you know, takes the reins and, and guides our family in the right direction, especially when it comes to the kids is, is pretty amazing because, uh, everything out of the household, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, very in charge and, and have to make a lot of decisions. It's nice sometimes to uh, play second fiddle for a little bit. Yeah, I've been married for a couple of years now. And I, I early on got some really great advice. And it was uh, the, the advice that uh, if I'm uh, Mr. Right, she's one. Mrs. Oh, always right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you could magically have any band, artist, rapper, singer, songwriter play any yeah, venue, cool. it could be in the future yeah, or the question. past. So I, uh, uh, I just have the privilege of, uh, of, uh, of being with the Chainsmokers uh, in Vegas because they just invested in Mythical and uh, we got to go to their pre-party and we were in the DJ booth and the after party. So I've already checked that one off the box, you know, check that one off the list. Um, for me, um, and I think my wife knows this as well, I'm, I'm a huge Incubus fan um, and Red Hot Chili Peppers. So um, I think if I was oh, like, throwing an event cool. and someone had to ask my wife, like, what band should I bring? Who would Adam freak out over? She'd probably have a tough time um, between the two, but would probably go with Incubus. So uh, I would love uh, uh, to see them live, you know, and, and, and really be, be able to connect with them on a personal level. Yeah, well, I, could, I might be able to make that happen. I, right. I have a connection you, I'll get you a smoking room and, and the band, so. all good things. <laughs> Love that. Um, final question. How can our audience be yeah, um, so helpful us, to you, um, Adam? You know, we love uh, meeting talented founders. You know, they are sort of the life force that, that keeps us going. So anybody with information asymmetries that wants to do anything, um, talk to us, you know, even if you're not ready to, to raise the seed round, we still want to meet you. We want to put you in our CRM. We want to invite you to one of our dinners. You know, we want you to come and have an ideation session at our studio. Um, I think that's always really interesting. And, uh, and then deals, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, what specifically are you looking for? I don't want to send deals. They're going to waste your time. And I explained to them that literally no deal wastes our time because 
Um, it allows us a market map. It allows us to get smarter on the space. It influences how we, you know, think about a certain space. Um, so I just think the more uh, the more connection, the better. Uh, so smart founders, great deals, send them our way. And if people want to connect with you yeah, so, online, uh, what's a good channel? Anybody can reach out uh, to me over email, um, adam at struckcapital.com. Um, and then they can also, uh, you know, hit up info at struckcapital.com. Um, and then we, they can also go on our website um, and submit a form. But honestly, the best way to get in touch with me, and it shouldn't be that difficult, if you want, if you're an aspiring founder, um, you should be well networked enough uh, to be able to find someone that knows me. The bar is very low. It's not difficult. People are really open um, in the space to making intros. So the ideal situation is you can find somebody that has some sort of indirect relationship with me, even if I spoke to them once and just would know their name, that could say, hey, check this out. Um, that's how you can really separate yourself uh, from the noise. Yeah, so anybody listening that wants to talk to Adam, send me a note yeah, that, that he'll read and I'll forward it along. Yeah, awesome. Adam, you're a scholar and a gentleman. We're super lucky to have you in the Los Angeles tech market. And uh, this conversation was great. I. I loved it. I got to learn a bunch of stuff about you that yeah. uh, probably some of your friends don't even know. Well, so Kirk, thank you for giving me that. Easy guy that to awesome, chat with. Uh, it's always a pleasure when we connect. Um, keep doing what you're doing. I love the energy and inertia that you're bringing to the ecosystem as well. And uh, looking forward to uh, many years of future synergies and wishing you a happy and healthy new year. There it is.